Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Building Resilient and Sustainable Digital Supply Chains. Uh, I'm Anil Arora, the session chairman, and uh, I welcome all my panelists and the audience. Uh, we have a very august panel and a lead presentation from Mr. Rajesh Ray. So the background of the session is that the lessons from the pandemic situation tell us to put more emphasis on resilience, sustainability in our frameworks. Dependencies in global networks necessitate implementing new age technologies in supply chains, especially creating visibility in modular, modular supply chain ecosystems. We are here to explore resilient and sustainability challenges in global supply chains, lessons from successful companies in building resilient supply chains, and how can the digital technologies help us in making the supply chain sustainable in a VUCA world? So my August panel, which is headed by our lead presenter, Mr. Rajesh Ray, who is associate partner and head enterprise applications at the IBM India team. Mr. Ray is an associate partner at IBM GBS with 20 years of deep business and technology consulting experience in supply chain domain, currently advising a number of global companies on their digital transformation journey with a special focus on S4, HANA, IBP, advanced analytics, IoT, blockchain, and cognitive computing. He worked in client-facing roles for clients in Europe, North America, and Australia and New Zealand. He has a proven track record of designing and delivering IT-enabled global transformation programs for major corporations, and at present working as design authority for two large S4 projects in Europe. Thank you, Mr. J, for Mr. Ray, for uh, agreeing to be the lead presenter today. Uh, along with him, we have Mr. Benoit Jobalia. He's director sales from Armstrong Limited. He's known for speed, precision, and multitasking. Mr. Benoit has compressed a 20 years experience in his seven years of rich cross-functional work covering wide domains and of expertise from manufacturing to business development. He manages business development at Armstrong and supports the production team. Although from a manufacturing and engineering background, he's responsible for managing key accounts he has deep ex entrepreneurial experience and drives global expansion of business. He plays a vital role in setting up Armstrong production systems. Benoit is a gold medalist from Mumbai University, master's in manufacturing systems, and was also a topper in his bachelor's course in production engineering. Welcome, Benoit. Along with them, we have Mr. Rajiv Dinesh. He's head of data products for delivery. Mr. Rajiv heads data products team at delivery. He has a keen interest in using data and technology to transform mobility and sustainability. He has previously set up and exited two award-winning startups that apply machine learning and artificial intelligence in the field of urban mobility and distributed solar energy. Prior to his entrepreneurial journey, Rajiv worked as a strategy, con strategy consultant with BCG after completing his BTEC in IIT Delhi. Welcome, Rajiv. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Mr. Amit Mintal. He's founder, director of Association of Warehouse Developers and Om Kiran Logistics Park. Mr. Mittal is a chartered accountant and carries business experience of more than two decades. He's an entrepreneur and has successfully set up a distribution and warehousing company in India, employing more than 150 people. His relationship with his international clients is equally strong, which started with an accounting office in East Flanders, Belgium, as their back office. He's co-promoter of upcoming technology company in Europe, which is developing off-grid power storage solutions. He brings with him over a decade of experience, both financial and managerial knowledge of operations and business setup knowledge in India and is a board member of Belgium Luxembourg Business Association in India, Indo-Dutch Business Sciences, Business and Sciences and Association of Warehouse Developers. Last but not the least, we have Dr. Rakesh Sinha. He's the founder and CEO of Reflexive Supply Chain Solutions. 
Dr. Sinha has worked with Godrej Consumer Products for almost four decades with leading roles in manufacturing, projects, supply chain, strategy, IT, and marketing. His experience spans across several countries, including India, US, Indonesia, Africa, Argentina, Argentina, and Chile. He was the global head of supply chain, manufacturing, and IT before his superannuation. He holds distinction of being the first doctorate in supply chain management in India. Congratulations, sir. His main area of expertise lies in designing and running agile supply chains to synchronize product supply with consumer demand on dynamic basis. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for taking the time out from your busy schedule today. I hope uh, as a panel and as uh, audience, we learn a lot from each other. And I hand over the mic to Mr. Ray, who is going to be our lead presenter for the day. Do you want to share um, the presentation or, or I will share it? Uh, I think uh, uh, CII host will uh, be sharing the presentation, sir. Okay. okay. John, can we have the presentation live, please? Yeah, Mr. Rajesh, you are the presenter now. Can uh, share your presentation. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Anil, for introducing. And I think we have a, a very eminent panelist today uh, who will discuss the topic um, in length. And let me uh, start with a brief background of what is digital supply chain, because I think most of us know the concept. There are so many articles get published. There are so many news happening around us that we more or less know what is digital supply chain. So what I will try to focus in my presentation is on uh, three great studies, which is essentially uh, some of the engagements which I was doing um, with my clients. Uh, unfortunately, all of these are, are not from India and hopefully in future we'll have more published case studies from India as well. And I didn't get the opportunity to work much in India for digital supply chain project implementation. So these experiences are mostly uh, from companies abroad. However, I think there is a, there, is, there are some great learnings which you can take from them. And it's, it's more to understand that how we can use technologies um, really uh, in, in areas where there is a business case improvement. Because at the end of the day, uh, you, can, you can use latest and greatest technology, but it does not, if it does not give you business benefit or if it does not bring a uh, positive impact on whatever business KPIs you have, or new ways of doing business, then I think uh, it does not um, really uh, make sense to adopt it. Now, all these three companies, the examples what I will talk about here, are from conventional business. The conventional business means they are not like dot com companies today. And I think you know, as you get into the dot com world or the worlds of amazon and uber they are much advanced in digital supply chain uh, compared to conventional manufacturing companies but i take the examples specifically for these reasons because these people started long back there are most they are 100 years old companies all of these this they were they were in the conventional business and then how they had adopted this digital transformation to move to new business models. And as you all know, like, you know, uh, Uber and Amazons of the world, they didn't have any legacy. So they started uh, from the day one itself as a digital business model. Uber from the day one itself wanted to be company which will be the largest car company in the world without having a single car at their repository. So that that's that, that they, they were very different because that the business model itself was very different. But, but the, the examples which I talk, will talk about today 
is more about the conventional manufacturing logistics companies which moved to digital uh, supply chain, which, which had done digital transformation of their supply chain processes to do the things in a different way. So that's where we'll start. Uh, I, I, I'll first uh, talk about a little bit about digital value chain. So as I'm, I'm taking a very simplistic four domains of the supply chain, which all of our, us are aware, like the planning is one part, which is the supply chain planning part, inbound supply chain. I think all of you know what is inbound supply chain. Inbound supply chain is essentially moving the materials from your suppliers through transportation to the factory warehouses or factory ground. The third activity is manufacturing. Again, here I'm talking about a manufacturing company, which is a logistics company, probably production will not be an activity, <clears throat> but this is a manufacturing company which has production. And finally, outbound distribution. Outbound distribution is essentially, as we all know, moving the materials from the factory's finished food warehouse up to the final customer. Now, I had given examples of some use cases in each of these where digital technologies are making difference. Now, let me uh, tell you, these are just, um, just examples, and it's not that this is a comprehensive list, and I think no one in the world knows in each of these areas the a comprehensive list because it's all lived to our imagination, what we can do with the technologies for each of the business processes. Like, I, I, I will not go through the entire list, I'll probably talk about one or two. Uh, like in the planning, there is a lot of focus on next generation demand forecasting with unstructured data with more granular data. I think all of us know that the traditional ways of doing demand forecasting used to be that we used to look at three or four years of last history. On top of that, we used to use some statistical forecasting models, etc., and we used to get a kind of base demand plan on top of that we used to add promotions etc to get a final demand plan now that's the model which is getting challenged increasingly the, there are multiple reasons for that first of all you can all see that during the covid time the sales were very different from the usual ones like you know <clears throat> for grocery companies their sales had become three times than the normal because people are really piling up groceries in fear of lockdown but for say automobile and many other industries, the sales was sales was drastically, and especially for luxury goods, the sales was drastically low. Now with this history, if you try to really want to do any kind of statistical forecasting, you have a challenge because your your past sales does not reflect the future. Uh, in the same way, there is a lots of new products in production started happening for every company and where you have a very little history. So again, trying to do statistical forecasting, building forecasting models got challenged because you really have these histories. Like, you know, nowadays you look, if you look at a mobile phone, hardly it has 18 to 24 months of uh, period during which the, the peak sales happen. So so there are there are different reasons for which people have tried, started looking at uh, other indicators, uh, unstructured data, uh, uh, more point of sales data, more downstream data, uh, data from social media, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where digital technologies had a lot of intervention because really if you want to look at data from your past sales figure, say how much you had sold to a thousand distributors, that was a very different ball grain from that if you want to really see that how much data uh, how much actual sales had happened at each store point of sales actually you are looking probably millions of data points and uh, you need digital technologies like say big data analytics platform to really make sense out of this huge amount of data to find pattern to find trend amount in that so planning is one part in the same way inbound supply chain so as we are getting into, again, I'll pick up one from here, like supplier collaboration, which is increasingly becoming important because some of the industries, like say electronics industry, you can think about uh, that uh, your collaboration with the suppliers is very important because most of your components come from them. And how much of that you can do really, really automate it with digital technologies. 
um, and you know, uh, as as in the recent COVID, all of us have seen that the supply chain set broken in many cases because the because many companies were not even knowing who is their tier two and tier three suppliers for their lifelong. They're only 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 talk to their tier one suppliers, and as as you know, uh, the, the as 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 the COVID situation started. Uh, tire one supply got dried up because you know the tire two supply could not uh, could not send materials on time, um, and and you know the final the supply chain is broken, uh, and you can see the implications of that in many ways. Like you know, uh, just let's take an example of the pharma industry. Uh, like a lot of pharma companies in US, which is supposed to get materials from India, uh, India certain territories were not that badly affected by COVID. But Indian this medicine companies used to source most of their API from China, so that was the second tier supply chain, and that got totally broken, and that's how our supply chain got broken. So there are a lot of retailers in US uh, during COVID-19. I'm sure you have read the reports who, who told that they were not even knowing till date that who is their tier two and tier three suppliers. So doing this entire thing, how we can really ensure traceability in your supply chain from where the materials are coming from where all the components are coming from which countries it is coming uh, using technology for that for the inbound supply chain has become a big investment again getting into the production like you know uh, using more sensor based technologies for predictive maintenance because usual ways of maintenance used to be the machine had broken and then you go and fix it um, and but there is a preventive maintenance calendar which everyone follows. Having said that, also uh, the machines fail, and most of the times for the maintenance department actually goes in breakdown maintenance handling. So, so how we can use sensors in the machines more effectively so that it can predict before the machine fails. Like you know, if a pump's vibration goes beyond a decibel level, the pumps itself start sending indicators, and then uh, you know that you know then. That there's probably a replacement needed, otherwise they it may fail. Like this may become very important for certain material handling companies who who operate in very remote locations, like in the mine locations. So you're working with a company who supply material handling equipment for mine operators, and these locations are really remote. And and the machines itself, if they start, don't send you uh, signals that there is chances of breakdown. If the breakdown happens, then probably will need three or four days to send them the necessary spares. Now, in the earlier days, people had taken more conservative approach, so we built up lots of inventory of spares uh, because you don't know when, when it will fail, and that obviously increases your cost and, and, and chances of obsolescence. So people are trying to use more predictive and sensor-based technologies here where the machines have become smart machines and they start sending you, uh, you know, signals much before actually the failure happens. And the last example which I want to talk about is outbound distribution. The same way people are using uh, lots of digital technologies in terms of route planning, scheduling, uh, warehouse optimization. Warehouses are getting run by robotics. So if you, if you, I'm sure that you have seen the YouTube videos, some of the most advanced uh, warehouses of Amazon, you will hardly see people there. It is almost everything is run by robots. So well, how the robotic technologies and automation technologies have changed the warehouses, uh, the sophisticated route planning and scheduling applications have changed the way we want to ensure that the trucks are not running empty. At the same time, trucks are not um, also covering distance when there is no load on the truck. So both not both empty mile runs and empty load runs. So those are. I just taken one example from each to tell you that how digital technologies are making a difference in each of these. Uh, I little bit talk about technology. So I think most of the companies, what you see the left hand side, having some business intelligence applications, having some ERP applications, some of the EDI applications, EDIA stands for electronic data interchange, that most of the companies have as of today. So that's no longer differentiating. That does not mean that the companies don't, don't need it because if you don't need it, you don't have uh, the ways to generate data in the system because ERP creates a lot of data within the system. Um, so that's definitely needed, but that's no longer a differentiating capability. So you, you need to have it that has become like a basic hygiene. 
whatever you see in the middle block, like cloud, big data analytics, internet of things, machine to machine, blockchain, augmented reality, all these are the technologies which are proven and valuable. In the sense proven, what I have to tell is that most cases you will find that people are doing proof of concepts, pilots with these technologies in small scale. They find value in it and then they go for bigger adoption. Um, so uh, in, in, in most of the companies you will find, most of the large manufacturing companies and logistics companies, they are toying with the idea of some of these technologies. It's not that all technology makes sense for every company, uh, but some of these may make sense and people typically start with pilot, proof of concept, find the early success, understand the challenges, and then take it for an industrial rollout. Whatever you see in the uh, right hand corner, at the end right hand corner, I think these are the technologies to be to come. Yes, there are you see you see nice videos in YouTube that there are companies who are actually making deliveries with drones. But yes, this is the technology which is yet to come in large scale. Um, and probably if we have this same session after say three years. Uh, we'll discuss about the technologies because these technologies will come into the mainstream. So that's a brief background about the technology which is making difference in the digital supply chain. I don't want to go into the each of these technologies because we don't have the you know that much time for this session, and I'm sure most of you know the basics about it. Now, next, what I will move into is that few quick examples. Uh, one example is from Walmart, um, where we were implementing a solution to ensure that the, every food product which is getting sold in Walmart store has traceability. Traceability in the sense that they know that from which processor, from which distributor, from which form the product has come. So as you know, as the product moved to a retail store, there are lots of stages to which the product can come from supplier it can go get into a manufacturer from manufacturer it can move to a distributor and from a distributor it can move to a retail store now in case of walmart the thing was little different in because in most cases walmart has a model where they don't operate through distributor they typically get from processors directly like say you know uh, say that they buy meat directly uh, from the large meat companies like tyson foods or they buy uh, uh, quite a few products directly from the farm. So if it is uh, green vegetables or fresh fruits, they directly bring it from farm. Now, having said that, they need to ensure, because these are food products and you know this is directly consumed by people, uh, they need to ensure that during that entire journey of the product from its source to its destination, the product is really uh, not got bad or some uh, uh, non-relevant product has come into the supply chain. Uh, so this is the project which we had done for uh, PepsiCo and Walmart. Now the reason that, that there are there are three things which that there are three problems which can happen. Fresh food products. The first thing is that this always need to remain in cold chain. That means from the farm to the store. When the product is coming, you need to ensure that nowhere in the supply chain, the temperature under which the, the, the product should you know, distribute it, that has become higher or lower. So in the sense that if the material is getting transported to a truck, the truck is refrigerated. Uh, now, here, this is an area where uh, Walmart had invested with, um, with the trucking companies and used IoT technologies also. Like if the weather ambient weather is 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 low, say that you know it's it's a cold day or 15 degree centigrade temperature, probably the truck did not be fully refrigerated. That the refrigerator did not be fully on because ambient temperature itself is low, and even if the refrigerator is not on, the product will be not get get you know uh, product will not get bad, and the product can be still delivered, uh, and and the product is not bad. But at the same time, if the, if the ambient temperature is high. They have to ensure that the product, always the AC in the trucks are operating, the refrigerators are really operating. Uh, so they want to trace from where the products have come, in which vehicle the, the product has come, and during the entire transit, the monitoring of temperature of that 
of the truck uh, through an IoT devices. And in the same way, for PepsiCo, the challenge was a little different. For PepsiCo, as they are not, uh, you know, uh, not um, handling much of uh, raw materials which need to be which, which need to be under cold chain. But you know, for the Fritole business, as you know, that they source lots of potatoes, and they need to ensure that these potatoes are getting are coming from the right farmers, and they are they, these farmers are not using unnecessarily high pesticides, so that the products may get uh, deteriorated, and uh, much of it cannot be even due to the inspection, some of it cannot be found out. So they need to ensure that. So that was the traceability which they wanted to establish by using technology and the technology used here is blockchain. The second example which I want to talk about is for PepsiCo in their manufacturing operations. So they so they, they had there if you see the a PepsiCo factory uh, this is an example from North America. The factories are very different as it was 20 years before but with using internet of things video data analytics etc the manufacturing process had totally changed today like just just to start the process that the sensors enable all the ingredient tracing so uh, as soon as you put the raw materials into the lines sensors knows that from which source it has come then robotic delivery of ingredients in time like you know so the first stage of the manufacturing needs uh, material one two three in the second stage you need four five six Robots ensure that the materials are delivered on time on the assembly line because you know earlier earlier used to, principle used to be all the materials need to be delivered much before the ship starts. That's why they are try, carrying a lot of work in progress inventory. And uh, you also need to understand that a lot of these raw materials are actually perishable products, which which is life for a few hours only. So if you really deliver it much longer, much before, then there is a chance that the product will get deteriorated. So. The, the robots ensure that the products really delivered on time to the line. Uh, if there is any kind of equipment problems, there are alerts which comes again from the sensors, which ensures that if there is any failure expected in the line, like you know some of the devices probably is vibrating more than the normal, then the, this alerts automatically let them know that know that. Then automated flavor delivery and clearing for changeover. So you know as you know that. It is a food company and the flavor is one of the ingredients and they need to ensure that you know in the last batch whatever flavor has been used that is not continued in the next batch now again something is done totally by robots today so in the entire machine changeover and the delivery and the cleaning of the last flavor is done by uh, by uh, totally by the machine now i i'm not going to get into the each and camera is monitoring entire the product routing and, and the product routing learns from the flow. Just, just to give you an example, camera monitors the entire production flow on an ongoing basis. And if there is higher rejection coming up of the line, for an example, uh, now uh, they, they have lots of video analytics by which they can actually change the parameters. That okay, probably in the first stage of operation, instead of four minutes, uh, when, the, when the operation was actually happened for 3.5 minutes, the rejection in the line was high. Uh, sorry, the, re the rejection in the line is low. So that shows that probably in the routing, they need to do some adjustment based on the video analytics data to ensure that the output is of the natural quality or of the required quality. And finally, all the preventive maintenance are dictated by analytics and it is being acted upon by the IoT sensors. And finally, the energy management in the whole flow, they, they, they monitor energy consumption very heavily. And again, the IoT devices monitor how much energies are getting consumed. And as I told earlier, uh, based on the video analytics and data analytics, they continuously see that if there is a more efficient way of designing the process so that the energy efficiency of the process can be improved. Finally, I come to the last example, which is for uh, a company known to everyone of you, which is for uh, DHL. And here we are doing a project uh, to figure out that how we can efficient run the improve the efficiency of their fleet management. So as you know, DHL uh, runs thousands of fleets, and some of their of their own fleets 
some of their uh, are the fleets which are contracted from um, our third party vendors at any time in North America. Uh, that's just uh, just to give you North America data because that's a published data. On, on a particular day, there are 80,000 uh, DHL trucks, trailers, different modes of transport are on road. And this really needs strong monitoring um, because, uh, it, because, you know, the uh, first thing is that to ensure that the materials are delivered on time to the customer. And at this and, and other cases, these are like connecting flights or connecting fleets in the sense that the fleet needs to take the material from the uh, from the source and deliver it to a port where a ship will leave on a particular day or it has to uh, drop the material at an airport where the flight will leave at a particular hour and even you know you all understand that the flight will not will wait for 10 minutes if the material is not coming on time the flight will leave or the port will the ship will leave the leave the port so a lot of that is for direct transport to the customer but a lot of that is also for multimodal transport. So that needs strong tracking of these fleets. That needs strong prediction engines because if they find that certain that, that you know there is a there is a uh, there is a uh, there is a huge uh, traffic on the road and they and the prediction engine is telling that the probably the truck will get delayed. They need to find out some alternate actions for that because uh, because as I told you the ship or uh, the flight will not wait. Uh, for the for the material to arrive, and all this so 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 this system uh, creates a lots of events on regular basis which need to be monitored, which need to be tracked, on which the acts action need to be taken, and this control and monitoring and managing all the tasks for that they are using heavily Internet of Things and analytics. So there is there is again a good example uh, that how they can use digital technologies to keep their cost of operation low, but at the same time to ensure uh, that the materials are always delivered on time. And at the same time, also the last one is, it is also uh, to ensure that their capacity utilization of all the vehicles are optimum to keep their cost at the best rate. Now, I will just end my example with one more uh, a small example which, which is the project in which we were engaged uh, some time back with a client and they were telling that lead to cast this is a process can you digitally enable this process in the sense i'll just give an example of this company this company makes special purpose machines and one of the challenge for them is that once if someone goes to them and asks that okay can you give me a quotation that i want to make this special purpose machine which will have these features can you give me a quotation for this uh, for this equipment? Now, the, the company's problem was that the company used to take four months to even give the quotation. The reason being that it is a machine which is getting manufactured for the first time because it's a special purpose machine. There is no history. And now they need to find out what components are needed. They need to find, they need to create a kind of engineering bomb for the whole finished good. And the, out of these components, maybe some of them they manufacture themselves. They need to take estimate from their manufacturing engineers how much how much uh, time it will take, what materials in, are needed, etc. Some of the materials they will not manufacture. They'll probably get it from a subcontractor or from a vendor. They need to get an estimate from them that how much it will cost, how much time it will take for you to time uh, time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to accommodate, you know, to bring all these things together they were having a very long lead time even to give a quotation. So they used to go back and tell, you know, quotation after four months. And then, you know, obviously for order to invoice and invoice to order. So lead to order itself, there is a long lead time problem. And as there is a long lead time problem, uh, in many other, many, many a time, the conversion ratios were, were low because, you know, some other competitor who could give a quote in three weeks probably was was uh, taking the order so lead to order the, the problem was lead time and the conversion ratio and the same way from the order to invoice also they had a problem because order to invoice there is a problem because once the order is order is received actually when they start manufacturing it and you know they start from uh, component uh, making the final uh, product by the time probably some of the component prices had changed if there is a lot of commodity items to this item then the prices had changed and uh, they were also they, they used to factor into some of these 
already into their you know quotation but you know it's all guess and the reality could be very different the prices were either increased or decreased or even the suppliers were sometime not uh, whatever time they had committed while giving the lead to order or the quotation that was they are not adhering to that and so they had a problem of, of actual delivery also in the sense that they were taking either longer or shorter term and also the amount was quite different from what they had quoted earlier and they had to prop they had the problem obviously to raise the invoice now because uh, invoice because in the in the quote or the agreement or the contract they had agreed to something but they are quite different now from uh, from actually when when they got the order they manufactured it and they are about to ship it uh, so the, on the order to invoice cycle they had challenges and finally as you know that invoice maybe amount may be quite different from the order they may probably in the delivery schedule uh, they had a problem in the sense that they had either uh, either crossed the delivery schedule or they had made it much earlier when the customer is not ready to take the delivery of the material because they had they had told nine months and the material was and everything was made in seven months uh, so in the invoice to cash cycle also they had a problem and they uh, and, and this is a project in which i is working and they told that can you look at my entire steps of the process and can you talk about that how i can put each part of the process how i can digitally enable it and we we in our term we used to call something like an intelligent workflow that's don't get too much bothered about this term intelligent workflow is a term which uh, ibm uses and which which is commonly used across industries also this day is a technology which we tried to adopt to this to improve the process now it's it's a long case study so i don't want to get to get into that because i don't want to take others time uh, but but just to tell you that just give a give a glimpse so what we tried to do is that we tried to break down on each part of the process each step of the process and try to find out that can we put and what kind of digital technologies we can put in each step of the process to make the process intelligent and to uh, solve some of the problems what we had told earlier they were not able to give a uh, quotation within 6 months they were you know uh, the, the lead to order conversion ratio was very poor um, order to cash cycle time was long because many a times they were invoice was very different from what they had projected initially as a quote so we tried to ex we, uh, get into each step of the process and try to find out that what are the digital technologies we can use uh, again, uh, there are lots, little bit of technology terms. To make it simple, we found that for each step of the process, there can be different technologies. Like invoicing, can we can use a digital worker who help in this process of invoicing? Can we use more um, of our cognitive collection platform to do the collection? So in the sense that it starts predicting that if there is a demand, if there is a if there is something happening and uh, you are expecting that, that there is a delay on the consignment, you start interacting with the customer much before to tell him why the reasons the delays are happening. And if there are some commercial implication of this delay much before, and, and, and you don't get the last step before you start ship, making the shipments because it obviously gets into disputes. And uh, try to use cognitive care in terms of all the support in the sense that most of these install uh, equipments, as these are special purpose equipments, these need installation also at the customer's premises, which is always covered in the contract. And can we use more cognitive care where we can use the learnings from installation of similar range of equipments in the past, which helps to make the entire installation process uh, much, um, much, much in terms of much less in time at the same time, you can do a lot of installation support remotely instead of sending a huge, uh, you know, uh, a number of people as a, as your installation engineers on site. Yes, you still will need probably one, one or two installation engineers on site, but most of the installation support can be done remotely, uh, where a customer care, cognitive care technologies can be used, where this support can be provided based on past experience to make this installation process much user friendly and wherever possible if some part of the installation customer can do themselves uh, uh, train them that they can do it themselves so with that i end my session uh, hopefully this was um, 
this was this this had given a glimpse of things which uh, where we are using digital technologies for different customers to make their supply chain process efficient i'll be happy to take any call uh, on the case studies which i discussed uh, thank you very much uh, mr ray for the elaborate presentation more than the presentation the description detail and yes, very very elaborate. Elaborate. and <laughs> we will we take will. questions at the end of the session participants can put their sessions uh, put their questions in the chat and we will look at that and consolidate and give you any questions that are coming your way uh, next up yeah thank you next up i i would uh, like to ask mr rakesh sena that uh, uh, sir in your sir vast experience uh, how can digital supply chain technologies help us in black swan events uh, figuring out that we've had one we might have a repeat of the same one or we might have new so uh, just an overarching view on how best these will help us uh, thanks anil and uh, good afternoon everyone uh, now these black swan events uh, they don't come very often that's uh, right but there are many small black swan events or we can call them a gray swan events which happen throughout and uh, if we are not careful we are likely to miss these events and most of the companies actually miss out on these events which keep happening almost on a daily basis in some part of the country or other for some products or the other uh, now, for us to leverage the technologies for the black swan events, the first and foremost point is that supply chain should have it should be well designed. Now, if the design of the supply chain is faulty, then any amount of digital technology is not going to help. So, to start with, we will assume that the supply chain design is right, and by design, I mean uh, uh, if we have to fulfill the dynamic consumer demand, typically for FMCG, pharma and food, etc. If you have to meet the dynamic consumer demand, then we should have the capability to, the supply chain should have the capability to do it. Now, when we talk of capability, there are basically three things that I want to focus on, three main things. One is uh, if we are still operating the supply chain based on the S&OP forecast, then there is no way we can handle the black swan or even the gray swan uh, events. There is no way because ask anybody, did they look at the forecast in the month of March or April last year or May or June? Nobody looked at the forecast. So when a black swan event comes, we can't really depend on the forecast and the same actually holds true with gray swan or even with a white swan. During normal times, uh, if we keep looking at the forecast and uh, running the supply chain to, to fulfill the forecast, we are missing out a lot on the potential consumer demand. So the first and foremost is, uh, have we designed the supply chain to be a demand driven supply chain? So as and when the demand at the most granular level, we are talking of a small geography at SKU level, if the demand is vastly different from, from what we had forecast, uh, how do we fulfill that? And we have seen, for example, in Godrej for certain products, the demand may actually be five times, 10 times, or even 20 times the forecast at a granular level. So unless we sense this demand, there is no way we are going to fulfill it. So the demand sensing is the first capability that we need and a lot of digital technologies are going to be helpful. Uh, at the granular level, if we need to do a near term demand forecasting, uh, we are talking of uh, in FMCG a distributor SQ level. So medium size FMCG company would have roughly 2000 distributors and 500 uh, SKUs or 1000 SKUs. So, are we sensing the demand at these 2 million uh, data points on a daily basis? Most of the companies actually have data in terms of customer orders at this granular level. 
If nothing else, we can start with using this data of customer orders and do a near term demand forecasting for the next 3 days, 5 days, 7 days. That's all that we need for running a demand driven supply chain. The important thing is to do it at the granular level and do it very frequently on a daily basis. If we can refresh the demand and use that for, uh, for product placements, then the 1st part is done of demand sensing. Now, the back end needs 2 more capabilities of flexibility in the entire supply chain, right? From vendors up to the distributors. And uh, responsiveness, how do we take fast action? on the changes in demand. So there are several technologies which are helpful. Uh, IoT has been widely used uh, to, to improve the responsiveness. In many companies, we see that the, uh, that the quality inspection and approval process becomes a bottleneck to the flow of products. So they are using technology like computer vision for online product quality check. Uh, actually speeds up the flow. Uh, we have seen uh, robotics coming in very handy at the end of line packaging for providing flexibility to produce multiple SKUs on the same line with uh, practically zero change over times. Uh, we have seen the use of drones for, uh, for predictive maintenance of say a boiler stacks. So instead of the routine annual check of the boiler stacks when the plant is shut down, but this can be done uh, online without stopping it. So there are several technologies which come in handy. But the key is, uh, in my opinion, not to identify a technology and then find a use case. I have seen several companies uh, who tell me that uh, we want to implement uh, Industry 4.0, we want to implement IoT, drones, robotics. Uh, so can you help us in finding the use cases? I think that's the... That's the wrong approach. We have to see what is coming in the way of, of uh, improving the customer order fulfillment. Where are the limitations? Uh, where are the obstacles? What's really coming in the way? And once we identify what's coming in the way and where is it? It could be in procurement, it could be in manufacturing, it could be in distribution. Wherever there are limitations, we have to find out which technology is going to help. For example, a simple track and trace technology using IoT could be very helpful in improving the, in, in removing the limitations in distribution. Uh, we have used IoT very successfully improving the flow of products on the production line. If the production line is under constraint and the demand is, uh, is uh, going through the roof, then how do we quickly de-bottleneck the line and improve the capacity? So we use simple technologies like IoT with sensors on a serial production line and using the sensor output and uh, to diagnose which part of the line is underperforming and taking corrective action on a dynamic basis. Uh, we improved the productivity of that line. It was a simple bottle filling line from 92 bottles per minute to 120 bottles per minute. So 30% improvement, but this could come because that was a real limitation. And if you identify a real limitation and then use the technology, it will give you the benefits. If the line is not a bottleneck, then there is no point improving the productivity of the line by 20% or 30%. It won't give you any benefits other than very, very small benefits in terms of lower, uh, lower labor cost. So cost saving is typically not the prime driver for adoption of these technologies. Flow improvement should be the prime driver. And if it can help us in improving flexibility, responsiveness, and better demand sensing, uh, then uh, I think we are, uh, we are putting these technologies to great use. And each of these technologies can solve a specific type of problem. What can be solved by drones cannot be solved by, by IoT. So we have to really identify where the bottlenecks are and then use the specific technology at that specific point to improve the uh, improve the supply chain performance now my experience with uh, working with a lot of companies uh, especially during the the pandemic is uh, i have seen there are basically three types of uh, of responses to pandemic 
the majority of the companies, I would say more than 95% of the companies uh, had a very fragile supply chain. Fragile, I mean, uh, in case of a black swan, there is a very limited gain and there's unlimited pain. And they were struggling to come back to the earlier normal to, to restore their production line and the entire uh, flow of products. These are very fragile companies. Their supply chain was not well designed. The supply, the companies with uh, with a better supply chain design, a demand driven supply chain, didn't really feel the pinch so much because they were quickly able to supply higher volumes of whatever was required in the market and cut down the production of items which were not in demand at the, during the, the pandemic. So these I would call as the robust uh, companies with robust supply chains. Very few companies had this supply chain already in place, demand driven supply chain, and they had limited uh, pain in the pandemic. The best companies are again taking a cue from uh, Nassim Taleb's uh, book on anti-fragile, are the ones who have an anti-fragile supply chain, which means every time there is a disruption, they tend to gain a lot. They don't feel the pinch, but they gain from disruption. So these companies uh, love black swan events. These companies love gray swan events and these supply chains work beautifully even when there is no black swan. So our endeavor should be to use these technologies, digital technologies to create a supply chain, which is anti-fragile, which can work beautifully during normal times and which can give us an edge during any disruption a gray swan or a black swan event. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, in the interest of time, I will just uh, quickly ask Mr. Mittal if he can share uh, from his uh, view, what were the real two or three uh, disruptions, on-ground disruptions that happened during this black, black swan? And what is the learning from, from a ground perspective as to if it happens again, what can be better handled? Hi, thanks, Anand. So I'll be talking of uh, COVID impact on warehousing. So before I come to this COVID impact, I would identify the three disruptors in warehousing in the recent uh, past few years. So we had uh, implementation of GST in 2017, uh, demonetization in 2016. Uh, both of these were planned event and we could uh, anticipate in advance and lots of preparations were done. But in fact, these two impacted warehousing at large. I'm associated with the uh, warehousing industries from the beginning of 21st century. Uh, at that time, it was like it was the, the places for storage were called godowns and warehouses uh, is a relatively newer usage of the same term in a in a new avatar i would say and then we had covid in march 19 which was neither planned nor anticipated never seen and neither in india nor anywhere in the world and it was an event which struck us hard so i remember when the first lockdown was announced, it was for two, three days. We were stocking up rations, supplies, groceries were all full. And it was anticipated that, okay, uh, say a week or so, and we'll be back to business. But it went on with one extension to another and uh, from days to weeks and weeks to months. So the first thing was uh, we were very fortunate as warehousing industry that we were allowed operations from end of March. Because warehousing as such uh, renders that storage and time utility to the goods and they were very important if the supply chain has to be ensured or uh, consumers have to be fed. So from 31st of March, there was an order from the ministry and uh, in fact, uh, they allowed us to operate. But the challenge was the, there was no clarity. So when I just look at the three uh, important things, number one, there was no clarity at the level of administration. We wanted to open our warehouses, but uh, the local administration did not allow us to do. So I am uh, uh, founder director of Association of Warehouse Developers of Uttar Pradesh. 
So we all warehouse owners got together, made few joint representation with our respective district authorities. Somehow, the first week of April, the situation was normalized and we were allowed to operate. The second challenge that had come was availability of manpower. Our supply chain is as strong as the people that work in the chain. So, on the one hand, we had all the obligation by district administration giving us the op uh, authorization to operate. All the responsibility of safety pro protocols were laid on the either on the operators of the warehouse or on the owners of the warehouse. So social distancing, having a, a slotted delivery and dispatch schedules. So these were the few challenges that we encountered. And then you, if you recall, there was an exodus of micro, migrant labor that happened. So suddenly you had uh, trucks without drivers or trucks without helpers or trucks with drivers help helpers, but you had no loaders. So it was a very peculiar situation and even the people who were managing the warehouse like supervisor or warehouse house in charge they were reluctant to come for two reasons either the public transport was not available if public transport or if they had a private transport the local authorities they had few red zones in the area where no movement was allowed even if they were allowed allowed to come to the warehouse their family had issues uh, when they were in the warehouse because there had been interaction so that was more like a very typical manpower hr issue and uh, how actually that was done, that was to reach out to them, to inform them, okay, all safety protocols are in place. We have a periodic body temperature monitoring, wearing of masks. So this was uh, one another thing that had impacted us manpower. It was planned in a, uh, I mean, uh, it was a challenge, but somehow it was planned. And the third major, I would say, was the, uh, there were few, Warehouses which were operating, another few were not operating. There were the cash flow challenges to us because the offices were not running and we were not getting our rentals. Our expenses were, uh, as it is, the utility bills were getting generated. The bank installments were there, though there was a moratorium, but still the installments were becoming due. So that was a big cash flow challenge. Few parties have chosen to involve force major clause, which was there in the agreement, but which was not very clear. So that was another, uh, I would say, a kind of a challenge which was happening at the uh, at a different level. So these are the few few things that uh, I would say would uh, actually impacted uh, the, during that time. No clarity in the rules regulation, availability of manpower, the operational guidelines to be followed in this kind of a situation, and number three on the level of cash flows and the agreement. Right. Uh, yeah. So uh, we, I think, all the entire industry went through these challenges, and the timelines which are mentioned by you are uh, pretty right. You know, it took about ten days to come back. I'll circle back to uh, to you at the end of the con at, at the end of uh, uh, this uh, session to you know get to know as to how you will prepare for better, uh, better. How will you uh, help uh, people prepare better in the case of next event? Meanwhile, uh, I am. Uh, I just want to ask Mr. Rajiv Dinesh that how AI driven system direction has helped to sustain network functions because there was a complete breakdown of human communication. Uh, a lot of companies had already invested in AI somewhere there, you know, somewhere in the middle. But uh, in your view and experience, how did this help cope with the breakdown? Thank you, Anil. Uh, so, for the purpose of uh, this discussion, I will stick to the transportation part. So, delivery, as uh, you might know, is a full stack uh, logistics company. So, from warehousing to uh, transportation. Uh, for the purpose, like, like I said, so just to show the power of AI in action, I'll take some examples from the transportation network part. Uh, so, right from the beginning, uh, the way I think uh, uh, Rajesh mentioned right in the beginning as well. So, a lot of the new age company delivery would be one of those have been uh, looking at digital as a foundational plank in the way they've built their business, right? So, our uh, thesis has always been that uh, on one hand, you have scale that uh, helps you, a uh, scale of operations that helps you drive down costs, that helps you uh, achieve better service levels, etc. 
And right from the beginning, the focus has been that we collect meaningful data from every activity that's happening in the network at scale, right? And use every, literally every action that happens in the network to make the overall network smarter, right? So create institutional knowledge out of and capabilities out of every action that is happening in the network. And use that obviously, and that kind of feeds back into the ability to drive down operational costs and improve service level, right? So that's been the focus uh, right from the beginning. And uh, let's and uh, one of the things that really helps is mention about communication, of human communication, right? So what happens is in a lot of large networks, we eventually the excellence of operation comes down to the people who are operating at different nodes of the network right and uh, as a delivery as a company operates across uh, 80500 pin codes plus in india which is almost like every part of india and uh, just to give a sense of scale so we do uh, deliver around a million shipments every day and we are, we are just uh, connecting back to the data part so there are like 20 to 25 uh, event scans on every shipment that gets captured in and converted into intelligence, right? So uh, again, so let me just also talk about a little bit about how we think about AI. And uh, broadly, there are three themes. So one is using this data to create intelligence. So intelligence on uh, geography, on location, right? So what is, uh, so in India, uh, the way we write addresses, even whether it is official or government sources or individuals are writing addresses, it is extremely unstructured, right? Every person, your neighbor, and you may have different ways of writing the address. Your address will be different on your water bill, your electricity bill, and your uh, you know property tax. So uh, the ability to understand this is a extremely key uh, capability that we have. And what what that helps us is once we are able to understand what uh, unstructured address string means in terms of what is the locality hierarchy that uh, or geographical elements that correspond with that we are able to capture a lot more information about the nature of moving in a particular geography the nature of customers in a particular geography etc so that is uh, one part of uh, the kind of intelligence that we create we create a lot of intelligence around our network right so this is around uh, the operation the performance and productivity of people on the last mile of people in the network we look at creating, uh, you know, estimated time of uh, arrival of different trips, whether it is within the network or going to the last uh, you know, edges of our network. Uh, we create our own capabilities because, uh, you know, logistics as an industry works differently from, say, you know, traffic movement on a car or a bike within a city. And uh, the way those things function are very different. And the ability to have this visibility is very important for us in terms of making our network dynamic, knowing when things will arrive at one spot and therefore what is the best action after that. And uh, also in terms of ensuring that we have proper service recovery uh, protocols in place. So network intelligence, product intelligence, understanding. So we work with not only like large companies like Amazon, Flipkart, doing their end-to-end -end, uh, deliveries. We also work with uh, large uh, FMCD companies. We work with thousands of small retail enterprises that are shipping through our network, right? Everybody has their own way of uh, entering information about products, right? So the description of a product will vary ex significantly across all these different uh, cohorts of uh, customers, right? Yeah. And uh, being able to understand how, what that means in terms of whether, what is the kind of product, whether it is dense, whether it is liquid, whether it is fragile, which will affect handling, et cetera. So those are kind of what we do on the intelligence side. Uh, right. The second pillar is uh, around uh, how we design the network based on how loads and are changing. Uh, given that, I mean, we are a company that uh, almost uh, go, has 50 to hundred percent growth every year, right? So uh, we need to be able to update our network to be optimum at any point of time. And the final part, the uh, question that you asked, which actually utilizes both these parts is the system direction. So once you have a load in a given network, right? How do you orchestrate the different actions uh, in order to get the best possible result? Which, uh, like I mentioned, uh, relies both upon our intelligence and our uh, the optimality of our 
system. So when the COVID lockdown happened, so for two days, uh, there was absolutely no action. People were trying to get it, uh, get to terms with what was happening. And uh, we were just saying, uh, we had already a month back, we had already gone into a work from home situation. We had anticipated this was coming and mm -hmm. uh, instituted strict pro protocols across all our facilities uh, across the country which will be 2000 last mile uh, facilities uh, around uh, 100 intermediate uh, facilities so we had already been prepared in that way and uh, within two days what we did so now what we have when we are creating intelligence not only actually a lot of uh, feedback from the ground to be able to make this uh, work better so within two days we were in a situation now where we had to answer four questions right so what when where and how so what from a perspective of what it was important for us the government restriction said that only uh, essential goods can be moved through the country so non-essential movements are liable to uh, you know uh, being locked up by the police quite simply right and uh, the first challenge was to figure out which items in our uh, network are treated as essential. So we worked on getting the definition of essential across different geographies. As soon as we had it, the ability that we had to classify different products, right? What is the category? What is the density, liquidity, fragility, et cetera, et cetera. So that helped us to identify the 10, 15% of shipments that were essential in the network, right? Uh, so the, that was the first thing we, and uh, the, considering the kind of data we uh, captured, we also know the you know, placement of every single uh, shipment in the facility. Second question was around where. So what what kind of movements are possible? Uh, what permits are available? Again, that kind of goes into the system that uh, and the system says, OK, these are the possible actions that we have. And this is the load that we have. Now, how do I orchestrate the movement? The other challenge here was uh, containment zone information, for instance, and red, orange, green. Uh, uh, information was being published in the form of, uh, you know, text lists across multiple, uh, you know, it could be at a district administration level, it could be at the state administration level or central level. And uh, we were, because of the, uh, you know, AI driven intelligence, we were able to code this into exact geographical pockets that were serviceable or not serviceable, or that may have different types of challenges in servicing. So that covers the uh, what part uh, in terms of how uh, I've already said. So yeah, we, we were able to see which are the kind of lanes that we are able to activate based on the permissions given by district, state, uh, central administrations. And we were able to, uh, you know, the system was able to figure out how to orchestrate movement given what uh, capacity, what resources are available to uh, move. Right, so this was a kind of the combination of these things, being able to identify the essential goods, being able to know what is the containment zone, being able to know what are the lanes we are able to move. And this, if you look at it, the definition of essential goods kept changing. The definition of what you could deliver in a green, orange, red zone kept changing. And for every shipment, we would have a combination of all these logics that uh, does not need to be interpreted by a human at the spot and therefore leaving to kind of suboptimal distance. And we could tell whether a shipment is ready to ship or not, and what is the next transit center for it. So all of this was kind of happening dynamically, which was way different from the way our uh, network would function normally. But yeah. it tended to be adaptive right off yeah. the bat. We were able to kind of adapt to the situation. So interesting uh, thought, uh, Mr. Dinesh. What do you think would have happened to your service recovery, you used a very, very, very nice term, yeah. service recovery. Had you been, let's say, 50% there in your uh, putting your uh, system learnings, AI driven system direction in place? So instead of two days or so, I think week, it, it, what, it would, would have, have become happened? extremely, yeah. So, two, three things I can see it would have become extremely human dependent. So, first of all, uh, getting people, uh, like, uh, you know, Mr. Mittal mentioned was, uh, massive challenge and i mean like while we are extolling the virtues of data like the real real victory in terms of uh, pure you know fortitude and you know intestinal fortitude was uh, played out by the operations team yeah. but the point is uh, just simple thing right 15 percent of sh shipments which are all mixed together because that's how they normally travel uh, out of a uh, hundred percent are essential they are the only ones that can be moved. just separating that 
would have kind of uh, we were up and running in 5000 pin codes within two days the only network not india post not any other logistics service within two days we were up and running in 5000 pin codes and within a week we, we uh, 10 days we were up and running in 15000 pin codes right so, so just all just, a, just a ballpark number what would this two days and 10 days would have been If you were halfway there, it, in your it, analytics. It have been, uh, it, so you can look at uh, how competitors came into action around forty-five days. Right? So, I mean, to reach uh, five thousand pin codes, it would have taken us forty-five days. Uh, that was it. And uh, as a result of that, we actually went past our so pre-pandemic whatever projections we had made. We actually went past that. So immediately we had done a revision. We felt that we would under uh, like the because of the entire industry being paralyzed. Hmm. we would actually end up underperforming but we actually ended up overperforming from our pre covid estimates as well fantastic and the other thing we were also able to do is we were able to use this intelligence to activate a lot of businesses so i may be a business that is shipping xyz goods across the country but i really don't know what is the current state of you know being able to ship that particular good in that particular area so we were able to give that feedback to our clients and actually activate them that why don't you start shipping uh, you know uh, whatever good in this in, uh, geography because it is now accepting the movement of those kind of goods fantastic thank you thank you very much mr dinesh uh, our last speaker uh, today's uh, panel member is mr binoy jobalia and uh, binoy i have a very interesting question for you because you've been you know an in engineering background automation you 20 years you must have seen the growth last 20 years has been uh, in terms of uh, uh, i mean automation is a very high word mechanization automation yeah. robotics i mean if you classify the three true how has covid changed the man versus machine balance for a for a, for a warehouse operation because you know india is a very cost centric country so i know you know people uh, always i mean we also work with a lot of companies today they we are always debating how much automation is good bad there are always a tipping balance question yes how has this event changed that balance actually whenever we try to deploy automation there are some drivers so these drivers that were there pre covid and the drivers that are there post covid that has uh, impacted that has undertaken a little bit of a change now if you talk about pre covid what were the drivers whenever we are looking at automation it was uh, productivity issues it was efficiency issues it was manpower availability uh, it was uh, low utilization of space damages etc but if you take the case of post covid what have been the real drivers of automation people have now started focusing on touchless to lights of warehouses initially it used to be about how efficient we are running a warehouse etc but now the focus has been of a touchless warehouse it has been a focus on lights of warehouse now the new challenges that have come uh, in the warehouse ops that where automation is playing a vital role is the business continuity and growth because everything of this thing came in a very sudden way uh people were now then talking about like okay uh, from the perspective of business continuity and growth we need automation uh people started changing their marketing language as well i mean if you say they started like it's a touchless product uh dominos will use the word that with the minimum touch points we are delivering the food to you so the safety element got added into it so with the help of automation people started to use stuff like okay the parcel is coming inside the warehouse with the minimum touch points is getting sorted and it's getting uh, loaded back into the truck and being delivered by the delivery boy so reduced touch points was the second uh, challenge which automation has helped the team to overcome and the third most important thing what has happened is that we saw a surge in the overall consumption because people started looking out for uh, the digital platform for procurement so in that case they required a completely scalable as well as a flexible model and that is something which in a situation like covid uh, manpower would surely not help them out so it was this time where uh, the balance got changed and people started focusing more towards automation for a much more scalable and a much more flexible operation and that's where they felt like okay dependency on manpower is not going to be the solution for uh, solving this problem and with the new social distancing norms etc so like a very simplistic example like whenever we are dispatching or we are loading a vehicle or a truck 
uh, initially we used to have four or five uh, operators who used to load the entire material inside the truck. But a simple automation technology like a telescopic truck loading conveyor helped them to achieve the same efficiency, the same output uh, with a 50% reduction in the manpower count, which means that even with the COVID uh, uh, rules, they could uh, attain the same business, uh, in fact, a little bit more amount of business uh, at the same time uh, having a 50% manpower. So at the same time, robotics could help uh, the team to uh, actually form the pilots, etc. So all these new upcoming automation technologies has actually made lives easy of uh, the warehouse operations team uh, and thereby keeping a control on their OPEX and at the same time also help them to increase their overall profitability. So this is how uh, the new balance has taken place after COVID, yeah. So the, did the finance man with the ROI sword on every project get out of the way? I would say yes. I mean, uh, they <laughs> their importance actually got a little bit low after the COVID thing because things were being driven more on the safety aspect and uh, more on the business continuity uh, aspect. So they their ROI calculations underwent a chain and at the same time, they are finance guys actually roped us in saying that please help us to calculate the total cost of ownership rather than just the ROI of the project. So uh, things underwent a change. Yes, <laughs> fantastic. I mean, for both you and Rajiv, COVID meant, you know, yeah, good yeah. business, big business. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. keeping the, uh, the, uh, the bad things aside, yes, from a business angle, it was it has actually helped us to ramp up business. Yeah. Uh, before I go back to Mr. Mithil, there's an interesting question from Mr. Sahil Deshpande. Uh, what he wants to know is that the warehouses, freight forwarders, transporters are key to supply chain investments in the right technology to assist the growth and seamless connectivity much required today. It's more of a statement, but there's a question at the end. We have seen when it comes to investments in technology or any such stake or any such stakeholders either do not have the budget or do not wish to allocate it. Another big issue is the adoption of such technologies. How to overcome the challenges? Uh, I think we've covered the the, the budgetary issue in our uh, discussion with Benoit. Uh, the challenges to technology adoption. I mean, the floor is open to either of the panelists who would like to uh, pitch in and say that it's a very dear subject to me because especially for companies which are of a smaller size, do not have a full scale IT department, full squad, not have a full scale logistics department. How do they single out and adopt technologies is, is you know, because the, the mental barrier has gone with the, with the COVID uh, happening that, you know, everybody wants to digitize, wants to go transparent, wants to you know, remote control, everything have control towers. But uh, I think the real challenge which Sahil has said is what are the challenges and how it can be overcome? Anybody can take the floor. So I'd like to just uh, chip in a bit. Uh, so I think uh, especially for uh, smaller companies, right? So it might not make sense to uh, uh, always, uh, you know, so there are areas that, uh, you know, so technology, we always need to take a call. What is the area that is most critical for us to separate our business, right? To distinguish our business and uh, need to focus the technology investment. And always, uh, I think this uh, something all the panelists will agree. Uh, technology can never be treated as an extra bell or whistle, but it has to be at this is in this age. We need to start thinking of it as a fundamental contributor to uh, business competitiveness, right? Uh, so one interesting thing that uh, I, I just want to share something that we are working on and uh, uh, I feel that that is going to be the nature of the future. So in, I don't think that we will have companies with very captive and exclusive uh, uh, AI based and digital systems, but instead what we'll have is ecosystem. So you participate in different ecosystems. So one example that we are all familiar with is how Somebody like Amazon, for example, they start giving technology to their suppliers to help them with, uh, you know, uh, even uh, seller, seller analytics, uh, including even how to kind of approach uh, uh, their marketing uh, in different geographies. So people like Google and Facebook become partners in your uh, marketing, digital marketing activity. So similarly, I see that kind of a trend happening in the supply chain. Uh, delivery itself has opened a 
uh, you know, office in Seattle where we are working exclusively on a platform product. So where we are trying to create a platform for commerce, which uh, does not, uh, so you can participate in different parts of it. You can use different capabilities that are uh, useful for your uh, business. You can plug into that kind of an ecosystem, use the power of, uh, you know, uh, data science using your own data or you know become uh, part of a larger ecosystem where you contribute some data and you consume the collective intelligence built on data contributed by multiple people like you so i see a transition into these ecosystem that where you work as part of these ecosystems you get the benefit so there are a lot of for example uh, mares has been a champion of uh, blockchain uh, across, uh, you know creating a blockchain uh, based ecosystem across the world so I see that uh, these ecosystems will enable even uh, smaller players to really leverage the capabilities of uh, data, right? So, and I think there is a, for the supply chain industry, there's a great amount of efficiency to be unlocked by uh, sharing these kind of uh, practices and capabilities rather than using it as, you know, a competitive advantage. That will only last for a while. Eventually it's going to be efficient ecosystems versus inefficient ecosystems rather than efficient companies versus inefficient companies. And therefore, the, I think okay. the technology is best uh, invested in the area that makes your business more competitive. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question from Dr. Uh, from Mr. Gropala Krishnan, how to prepare for Black Swan events if we have a fragile supply chain. Uh, I think that question has been debated all over by all the uh, participants aptly, but uh, uh, I would uh, like Mr. Sinha to just give a short comment on that. Uh, yeah, so the first is, uh, is are we tuned into what's the actual demand coming in from the marketplace? So they said the first step, step is to send them the demand sensing part. And as we sense the demand and then start fulfilling it, other things will fall in place over a period of time, like making the supply chain more flexible and responsive. Uh, so the basic principles of supply chain, starting from consumer backwards to distribution, manufacturing and vendors that works and that can take care of any, any black zone event, depending on the level of flexibility and responsiveness that we have developed as a capability. It's better to start from the demand sensing side. Thank you, sir. Uh, oh, I have one more question from uh, Dr. Smriti. How do we look at scalability in e-retail through a digital supply chain management? I think uh, uh, Rajiv, it will it will come back to you. Or, or sorry, uh, I think we can go back to Mr. Ray on this uh, because you know you've given examples from Walmart, PepsiCo, DHL. So, if, can we have some knowledge, some some knowledge sharing on uh, e-retail also? How these will work in e-retail scenarios? Uh, as I told, you know, uh, anything which is, uh, though, though Amazon says almost anything on everything on, 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 on an e-retail platform today, but there are, there are certain products which are more suitable for e-retail than others. Like, you know, I guess for an example, say if you want to buy a book or say if you want to buy a music or if you want to buy, if you are more or less sure in the products you are going to, going to get and, and, and people are more tuned to buy those kind of products on an e-retail platform. But, but today, if you want to buy two, uh, you a little concerned to buy at an e-retail platform. Because, you know, you just want to go to the shop, probably give it a see it is fitting you well, etc. So that's one thing. So there are certain kind of products uh, which is more suitable for e-retail and special in India. That's, that's something. And there are there are certain categories of products which will be for which it will become very popular. That's one. The second thing is that uh, one of the major major way the irritant can really penetrate uh, beyond the uh, beyond a limit in in our country because all said and done, if you see Amazon's and uh, Brofers and uh, say you know uh, Busted or any other retail companies probably to 100 cities in the in in our whole country so they are mostly in big cities tier two cities started operating in tier three cities but but not beyond that uh, yet so there are there are few things which will which will help in that one is obviously internet penetration 
second is getting good logistics provider who can you know third who can really do last leg delivery of logistics like you know when I, I, I sit in howrah in calcutta so from calcutta if you go to 150 kilometers way uh, I, i know there are there are places where uh, people if they order something on delivery there is there is it is very difficult to get to a last like logistics delivery at home so that's that's again something which you which you see and that is something we have seen during the covid days like you know britannias and itcs they were tying up with companies like swiggy deliveries to make the deliveries happen so that's one important thing internet penetration is one important thing as i told second thing is getting last like logistics provider third thing is that uh, you know probably uh in terms of also uh safety of payment systems because still uh, all said and done sometimes uh especially to, especially among aged people uh, uh people uh, fear to credit card number on a on a site and uh, those are particularly really strong but i think also it will play a role so in in essence i think those are few capabilities one will be internet penetration second will be uh, last leg logistics delivery capability at an efficient cost uh, third will be payment where no one is fearing that you know to to give his number uh, to any any site fourth is also to certain extent omni channel in the sense that i order something on online but if if i need to return it and take an alternate product there is uh, there is a physical store Where I can go and exchange the product, like Amazon had tried to build build up that model with with, with Big Bazaar, and that you know after the Big Bazaar is taken over by Reliance, I think I think that story is changing. But It's but you know, and but in but in but in uh, developed countries, you will find that is the case. That you know, just like Tesco, you can buy something online, but you can go to a physical store and 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 take uh, take the return if needed. So that's also will drive the way um, you see the this uh, this. uh the penetration of e retail really goes up i think those are the four that in my mind will be here right thank you sir thank you uh interestingly we have a presentation 10 minute presentation coming in from binoy with respect to automation drivers of automation post covid uh we've got an extension from cii to extend the session by 15 minutes so uh, binoy please go ahead with your presentation thanks thanks uh, i hope my screen is visible right yes very much great okay uh, so quickly in the next 10 minutes i'll just explain you all about what were the real drivers about automation pre covid and post covid and some of like i can take some two case studies where uh, some of the indian companies have actually uh, deployed automation and how it has helped them to scale up to the next volumes and uh, counter the covid uh, challenges so pre covid uh, as i said earlier low productivity less profitability dependency on manpower in terms of skill and the count both in terms of uh, poor space utilization and thereby having a high opex uh, lack of visibility and not having the right traceability of your uh, product inside the warehouse uh, damages and thereby leading to revenue loss these were the drivers for automation pre covid but now the right time has come in which we can focus from a journey a journey which is from a touchless to a light soft warehouse over here we can actually focus on two major areas uh by doing reducing the touch points we can increase on the overall uh, hygiene standpoint and the safety standpoint of the shipments or any material that we are talking about which is flowing within the warehouses and at the same time we are also focusing on uh, reducing or uh, eliminating the dependency on manpower uh, to run the warehouse operation so the new theme which majority of these companies are now following is uh, touchless to lights of warehouse uh so now how exactly are we doing that so what are the new areas which we are focusing upon which can help to drive automation for uh, the new concept uh so basically post covid people had new challenges like i just said business continuity and growth they themselves felt that okay if we don't deploy automations uh, business itself is at stake and uh, we don't foresee a growth coming up 
or like uh, reduce the touch points or even focus on scalability and flexibility i mean these two are very important things like how we can bring in scalability with the help of automation like we have these seasons coming up we have the big billion day or the amazon sale coming up so at that time in covid it was very challenging for them to increase or ramp up the manpower count at such areas at such times automation has played a very vital role by which they could actually meet the demands of the season and thereby even being uh, not dependent on the overall manpower count uh, so why exactly is it uh, important at the end everything boils down to the most important point that's customer delight uh, and how do we do that we do that by bringing in touchless automation we bringing it by uh, the speed to market so the time from which a shipment is actually being picked up to the time it's getting delivered to the final user uh expansion in the same space so we are bringing in like more volume and more variety uh, thereby even controlling on your fixed uh, capex of your uh, uh, land or your size of your warehouse uh, we are trying to optimize your overall op uh, operating expenditure and thereby focusing on your higher profitability now to do this what we have done is that how we can conquer covid 19 uh, so we created a matrix a matrix which is very easy to Uh, remember by which any user who wants to actually look into automation he can just try to create a position where he uh, belongs to with this matrix and then he can get the right answer saying that whether automation is the right uh, solution for his problem so keeping in mind two things one is increasing your overall revenue your top line and at the same time we also want to increase your overall profitability so basically even uh, increasing your bottom line so how do we do that uh any company who has a focus on these 5 week us can actually uh, deploy automation in a very simplistic manner and thereby reap the benefits so the 5 v's are visibility quality of your material the volume at which you are playing around the variety i mean the number of sqs that you are handling the value of the goods itself so if you try and create around a matrix across these 5 v's you will be getting an answer at the same time this q and the s which in for i mean it involves on the quality and the safety aspects so these are the areas which we can focus upon uh, create solutions using automation and thereby increase your revenue and profitability uh so these are the areas usually where people started deploying automation let it be an inbound let it be warehouse storage automation let it be robotics let it be sortation systems let it be your transfer systems or let it be the heart of the entire warehouse the software piece so these are the areas where people could actually focus upon and select the right automation technology to reap the benefits uh some case studies which i can just explain in a minute uh one of the leading food fmcg company in india uh based out of calcutta so they are into edible oil so after people staying out at home uh, the overall consumption etc itself had increased and for them to cater these growing demands it was exceptionally important and they didn't want to lose out on this business opportunity so it was about high touch points and manual handling uh, low productivity and throughput and slow market replenishment uh, we did a complete thorough analysis and in covid this solution was deployed so right from the time the box was actually getting packed it was an edible oil product till the time it was getting loaded inside the truck it was a completely automated system and thereby they could actually attain a business growth of almost 35 to 40% in the time of covid so the benefits that they could get were higher profitability with productivity faster and a wider market fulfillment and yes uh, with a reduced touch points so it was practically a completely manually operated driven uh, solution going into a completely automated solution so this was one of the case studies which one of the uh, food companies actually uh, did it in in india uh, similarly there was one of the retail fulfillment and a distribution center also where they focused upon how uh, actually the automation helped them to multifold their turnover in the same space uh, it helped them to reduce their touch points a quicker inventory and order processing uh, less less amount of error uh, completely error free operations so they automated their complete inbound automation their complete sortation systems and a complete outbound automation so we focused upon how we could bring in a enhanced vehicle turnaround and uh, eliminating their revenue loss due to wrong dispatches 
so this was some of the case studies which i thought we could uh, share and uh, how automation has helped to uh, bring in a lot of benefits to our indian customers yeah uh, thank you thank you uh, banoy uh, for the quick presentation uh yeah. for my uh, five minutes of fame i'll just give the closing remarks what i saw and what i felt i think the audience would have also felt more or less the same uh key points from mr uh, mr ray's presentation and which i think all the supply chain professionals are feeling somewhere or the other is that the traditional demand forecasting model is passe uh collection of data from various sources i mean the triangulation method is also history because it's now a a, a multilateral or a multi angle uh, data collection and sorting and you know then analytics to make sense out of it because uh, with all the augmentation of automation sensors ai the 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 incoming data points or data sources have also multiplied so out goes the traditional demand planning and forecasting model comes in the data driven and as uh, mr sinha rightly said the the demand driven model uh, of course uh, productions will still happen on some kind of forecasting but every whatever was being adjusted on quarterly uh, six monthly basis half yearly basis will now be a, a dynamic environment where all the supply chains will be adjusting readjusting their forecast according to the demand or what's being picked up on the shelf as quickly as possible uh mr ray also thank you very much for giving us live examples from world leaders in supply chain where ibm has helped them walmart pepsico dhl uh, particularly the lead to cash cycle management which i think is key to any business was a very interesting and intriguing example to share thank you very much uh Mr Sinha's very interesting point is that you have to get the supply chain design right before you digitize and i think this is a very very important takeaway from this session because a lot of us just implement technologies without getting the design right or without getting the basics right and then blame the technology for not delivering so uh, thank you very much sir for that for that insight also your focus on Uh, collecting granular data of, uh, of your talk has been uh, i think doing the rounds everywhere but now with again new technologies and so much of uh, digital supply chain tools it is possible to you know uh, get granular with the data thank you very much uh, from uh, mr mithil a uh, very interesting take on planned disruption versus unplanned disruption yes warehousing went through two unplanned or uh, two planned disruptions in last 3 years but uh, the unplanned disruption was like a reset button and i think all of us feel now that all investments going into supply chain will be will be very well honored uh, once we've seen that you know how robust supply chain responds and fragile supply chain response is to such events everybody will i mean i'm not saying the lean methodologies will go out of the window but somewhere or the other robustness or sustainability will become or has become the 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 foremost thought on any supply chain director supply chain planner or any board's mind and hence we'll see increased investment and focus into supply chain uh mr dinesh elaborated how delivery became the hunter from the hunted pre covid it was in the news also that you know the investors were asking questions and uh, the trade was asking questions that where where is delivery going but the the service recovery within 2 days to 5 days or 10 days changed the game for them and they became a leading last mile service provider and everybody started looking at them differently thank you very much for sharing that Benoy, of course, the detailed presentation and the takes earlier, where you know uh, we have got a clear picture that how boards look at investing into supply chain. I guess overall it was a very interesting session, gentlemen. I will once again like to thank you for taking time out from your uh, busy schedule, and I'd like to thank CI Institute of Logistics 
for putting this august panel together and giving me the honor of chairing it thank you very much uh, john uh, dr banumati the our director mr mahidev for giving us this forum thank you very much